Hey everyone, for this week's video we are doing a how-to guide on how to fight within visual range with the F-14. We're going to be primarily focusing on the deployment of the Sidewinder and the Sparrow missiles without using a human reel. We will also be orientating this guide for the dynamic Cold War campaign server, but it should apply to all servers. If this is your first time here, this channel focuses on multiplayer sim gameplay, so if you're into that, please subscribe. The F-14 is a really great module and a favorite within the community. The issue with it though is that on a lot of servers this great module essentially just gets boiled down to a modern day catapult. And what I mean by that is it effectively just gets used as a phoenix launcher and that's it. I think it's fair to say that this module can do a whole lot more and since the existence of this module the majority of its flight time online has really just been deploying phoenixes and there's a communal rust that needs to be shaken off in order to use this thing in a non-BVR setting. My hope is that with this video, we can start to shake that rust off. Before we dive into all that, let's get a grounding on the weapons. We will be primarily speaking about the AIM-7F and the AIM-9L. The AIM-7F and AIM-9L are very strong weapons in the dynamic Cold War campaign server, especially when you combine it with the look-down, shoot-down capability of the F-14's radar. Additionally, the amount of sticks F-14 can carry is quite a lot in a Cold War setting. The typical loadout you may want to take is four sparrows on the center pylons and four sidewinders on the outer pylons. You could take up to six sparrows if you wanted to trade out two sidewinders, but in a Cold War setting you probably want the extra sidewinders. When fighting against MiG-29s, you can rest easy to know that your sparrow will outrange them. Here is a comparison that I found from Gold Wolf on the TCS re reference area. I'll leave a link in the description. These numbers are probably best case scenario shots, which rarely or almost never happen in the wild. But what I draw your attention to is to just compare the ratio between the missiles on the MiG-29 and the F-14 in, in the Cold War setting. The F-14 does have more range with its missiles, and the AIM-9L is probably the best heater next to its immediate time-appropriate counterparts because of its range and, and uh, it being all aspect. Lastly, the F-14 has a lot of fuel, so you can really sling your missiles out to give them extra legs by going in full burn. Now that we've set this foundation, let's go over deploying the weapons while using Jester. We'll start off by dro dropping our fuel bags so we're ready for a close encounter. Press A to bring up the Jester menu. Press A again in the center. Go to 3 and then 1. Jester will then confirm. Drop external tanks and pickle. And you'll get the audio and we have now dropped our fuel bags and we're ready to start fighting. First things first, we'll go over the Sidewinder. Now we need to prepare our jet to be able to deploy this. So what we'll do is hide our joystick with backspace. Master arm will come up. Sidewinder cool and missile prep are already up, but when I cold start, these will be down. And then I like to put my gun rate on high. You also need to make sure you validate that your gun counter has been manually turned up already. Along with that, I switched the radar mode on. We want as much visibility as possible, so we can go ahead and hide that. And now we're ready to start selecting weapons. The weapon selector up and down button is all you really need in the Cold War server, but if you want shortcuts, there's additional ones. Now we're talking about the Sidewinder, so when we switch to Sidewinder, we now hear the tone. I've added this red X to make it clear that the Seeker head is still looking for target. It hasn't actually seen anything yet. This is really important to know. Now, when the Seeker head does see something, the tone changes, and we hear that. And the green mark, which I've added, shows this. So we can fire and it will track. Now, the important thing to know here is that the Seeker head is following a certain pattern, and it is possible for it to quickly lose and pick up tracking again, and you have to be very mindful of that. Now, if you want to make sure and get a better visual ID to make sure that your Seeker head's actually seen something, you can adjust and use the seam lock or the uncage and you see this extra visual indicator on your HUD. Essentially what's happened is the seeker head is uncaged and it's now following a seeker head. It'll look for four and a half seconds. If it doesn't see anything, it goes back to the neutral position. But because it sees something, it's actually following it. And you can see as I'm rocking my plane back and forth, and it still kept a log. I'm gonna go ahead and fire. Now, because I fired, my Sidewinder is caged again, and we hear the tone has changed. My missile's already out the way, it's tracking, and we're gonna see that it hits. The uncage is very, very strong, and this is one of the biggest advantages of the F-14. You can really lead shots super well with it. We'll transition to the Sparrow now. 
And then following that, we'll have some real life examples. So we see some radar contacts up ahead, which a gesture will call out. We have a bandit two ship, Bra 280, 15 miles. And we can use the key mapper to have him target something okay. in front of us. Okay, he's locked. Target, 15 miles. Now, if you don't target an enemy outright, you can validate by using the TV camera, which is a very important keybind to have. Lost it, lost the lock. Now, Jester will lose the lock occasionally, so Not it's, able. it's important to Roger. try to keep spamming I the button. The and what you can hear him is dropping the lock not able to pick it back up, then able to pick it up. I find that it's useful to go back and forth between the buttons and to use TV camera to validate what you're actually targeting. Now, in this instance, target 13 miles. We know it's a target. Um, we knew previously because I used the enemy target lock up ahead that this is an enemy. But just for the sake of this video, we're going to rely on the camera to really validate that. Roger. I have a lock. So as we're coming up on this target, I'm looking and it looks like a fish bed. So I'm feeling pretty good about this. And we're gonna run into the issue of bold aspect shots. Target, 12 miles. Now, the data I provided earlier says that this missile should hit. And this is why it's dangerous just to look at straight up data because a real data chart would look at the range that you're firing at, the altitude, if it's a cold, hot aspect, and we're shooting this within 20 miles. He's cold, and this missile's not going to hit because it's just going too fast. Like the range is getting stretched out because we're heading in the same direction. Additionally, what we see here is the ground clutter, and if you fire too far out, it's very easy for your enemy to dive and you'll lose them. And you can see I'm using the vertical PAL scan. And just because of the ground clutter, the radar can't pick them up. And now I'm using the side to side scan, the horizontal scan, and I'm picking up another contact at the left, which is not the one that I'm interested in. These two modes are very important to use because sometimes Jester is just having so much trouble and you're the man telling him manually to target something just doesn't work. And you'll need to use PAL um, especially when diving toward ground clutter. Uh, in straight up within visual range fighting in a dogfight, the PAL is just more useful. And you can see, yep, there we go, we got a lock now. So we definitely know three miles. that it's a fish bed. He's pulling straight up, I have another sparrow. I see that the range is quite close based on the HUD. 12 o'clock, honor 12, shark, flash. And we get a nice easy splash. So let's combine the two now. Nine o'clock low. Dale and I was cool. You're just too fast. Five eighty. Spike. Eight o'clock. Fast to five thirty. We're gonna use radar plus the sidewinder. Shit, he's on a six. Time for that pilot shit. Speed four sixty. There's three ninety. Let's turn the tide, man. Three five zero knots. So this is the second contact that we picked up earlier. And what we're gonna do here is use the PAL mode to help direct a Sidewinder. He's behind us, uh, we're doing a split S, and I'm gonna start doing vertical scan. And as soon as I pick something up, I'm gonna uncage. And this slaves the Sidewinder head to where the radar's looking. And we're gonna get a really quick missile off. And it's easy peasy. So the two modes together really work well. Now let's go to some real life examples to see how this works in the wild. I think it's super useful to see when things don't work out. That way you don't make the same mistake. F-14 has a lot of fuel and it has long range missiles for Cold War setting sparrows. So you want to fly high to give your missiles as much range as possible and lean into your range. With that said, you get caught in flying in the con a lot and that gives a huge situational awareness advantage to your enemy. In the situation, I'm split essing into a merge, I'm very late on using the PAL mode. And essentially what happens here is I enter this merge not knowing where the enemy is. I come up on the left side of the screen right now, and I don't see him, I'm looking at PAL, then I look behind me, and he's already started to turn while I was still flying straight. So I'm at a, I'm at a huge disadvantage here, and 
the lesson here is you can you can be put at a huge disadvantage by flying at altitude, pawning, not using PAL and entering into situation, situations with really bad SA and it'll get you killed. So try not to make this mistake, it's really easy to do. In the second example, I'm coming up on a three ship of MiG-21s. And there's a lot of little takeaways with this. First thing is, TV camera's awesome. Uh, I can see that it, there's a two ship here and they're flying information, so I can assume they're working together. That's good to know. And there's a third one, uh, which, because Overlord told me earlier. Now, 12 o'clock. I'm less than 20 miles, I'm quite high, uh, I'm decently fat about Mach 1, so this missile is going to have a lot of legs. Target, 13 miles. Now what the takeaway, or one of the takeaways from this video is you need That's to respect the fact that the enemy probably has R3R missiles. So I've let this missile go mode. just above 10 miles, I've confirmed with the TV camera that they're turning into me, and because if I the sidewind or the sparrow first, I need to keep my nose on in order for the missile to be effective. And we're gonna see the splash, and I immediately should use PLM mode to unlock and to start firing sidewinders off. But I got so caught up trying to unlock that I didn't turn off, and I ended up eating an R3R. MiG-21 has some bugs. The RWR warnings that you get from the MiG-21 are generally pretty late. Uh, if someone's hard locking you with the MiG-21, you may not know. And by the time you get a launch warning, it's already too late because they're basically firing within you know, the minimum parameters. So keep that in mind. The other thing I want to talk about is the speed of the Sparrow because it actually feels like a pretty slow missile in comparison to like an R27R, which is quite, uh, I want to call it nose hot, where it shoots off super fast, but it chases immediately after the target and will turn quite aggressively, while the Sparrow flies slower, but it's a little bit more gradual in its turns. And I think that's why the Sparrow has uh, much further range, or one of the reasons why it has more range. And what we're going to see in this example is how deceivingly slow or long it takes for a sparrow to hit some time. So we're about at 10 miles um, going after a B-21 that's climbing. And I'm gonna let this missile go off soon. He's going to realize that I'm going after him and he's gonna start diving and I, I let the missile go. So just sit here and look at how long this missile takes to hit him after launching it from 10 miles out and he's basically diving toward me and this takes so long that I actually end up firing a second missile because I thought that this was going to miss and the first one actually ends up hitting so here we go and I'm thinking to myself oh I won't hit let me fire off the second one which I do and I see the explosion so the first one ends up hitting the next example, what I want to talk about really quickly is, again, how useful the camera is. Um, you can get a lot of information just by literally looking at the enemy, and you essentially have a telescopic lens uh, on this plane. So I'm patrolling, it's cloudy. Uh, I do have a Rio in this situation, and he's going to pick up a target. Now, I mentioned earlier that you need to assume that the M21s have R3Rs because they're quite scary. So you need to respect that or you're going to run into issues. And we're going to see how the camera here helps to inform good decisions. So there's the radar contact. We're coming up on it. And the Rio is going to lock quite soon. There we go. I saw it for a moment on the HUD, so I know where, which direction to go in. And he picked it up, and I see a, a con. So we're less than 20 miles. I turn on the camera, and I go ahead and look at him. Have to respect the R3R, so I need to be careful here. Uh, I do have more range than him. And at this point, I was feeling a little bit nervous because I've even a few R3Rs uh, in practice of getting better with the F-14. So 
So I let a missile go, and just to see what he does, I look at him, and I see he's nose, not nose hot, and he's turning away, which for me helps to validate that I can keep my nose on, because I know there's not going to be a problem. So camera can be really useful, so don't forget to map it. In this next example, we're going to see the combination okay, we're on. of the Sparrow and the Sidewinder. So I'm pushing this guy, and I've fired a Sparrow. He's forced to turn cold and just to fly away. A little bit of lag there. Um, and I'm pressing him. I see that there's an air his airfield off to my 2 o'clock, and I can't chase him into there. So How essentially what I've done off? is I've shot a spare item. He's forced to turn cold. I know I can't chase him, but what I want to do, though, is now that I'm within 5 miles, there is a bandit I'm going to follow up with a sidewinder because he won't know that launch is coming. And now that I'm in really close range, he's still, still cold, he's, Mine, like he's turning, block. and I'm getting an RWR warning about the SAMs at the airfield. I go ahead and shoot a sidewinder, second sidewinder, and I turn off. Now that I've turned off, I've broken the the radar lock, so the sparrows are useless. Five and then we get a splash, and we find out that the splash is actually uh, from an, an IR missile. So these are all really important things to keep, to keep in mind. I generally think this module and this plane in, in, the, in the Cold War setting is really, really strong, but I think it's really misunderstood. Are you going to be able to knife fight MiG-29? No, but you have a you have the Sparrow to keep them at range or at bay, and you have the uncage on your Sidewinder, which makes it really strong. Along with that, give a lot of fuel. You can set the tempo of the fights. You can pick and choose your fights if you want. So keep this all in mind. I hope you guys found this video interesting. If you did, please consider subscribing, and I hope you have a good one. Thank you.